welcome, welcome, welcome. We welcome you to Grace today. So glad to see you here. Let's spread the love of Jesus Christ radically and without fear. Hear all our welcome. Yes, you are welcome to lift your hands and bless his holy name. Lay down your burden here at the altar. We welcome you to Grace Congregational. You're welcome at Grace Harlem. Find love at Grace Harlem. Spread peace at Grace Harlem. Find joy at Grace Harlem. Said you're welcome. To the hungry and depressed, the broken and confused, find love, forgiveness, healing in this place. Let us help one another as we lift our hands in praise. We welcome you to grace. We welcome you to grace. We welcome you to grace, amen. We welcome you to grace, congregation, no. Say you're welcome at grace, Harlem. Find love at grace, Harlem. Spread joy at grace, Harlem. Find peace at grace, Harlem. Say you're welcome here, all I will go Good morning, Grace. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby And daughters, did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you deliver will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. Oh, Mary. Sleep 
holy child, you're holy. Did you know, when you kiss baby Jesus, you kiss the face of God. Amen. What does it mean? What does Christmas mean to me? I know before you break out the eggnog and all the happy presents and tinsels, we ought to take a moment to talk about what Christmas really means. Because I think in all the hustle and all the bustle, we miss the meaning of Christmas. And so today I take you to a strange text. I know I'm out of the book of John. We'll resume book of John next, after starting of the first of the year. But I want to take you to a text, which is the first letter in the book in Romans to Paul, from Paul. And he writes to the Romans. And right off from the beginning of his letter, he actually takes the point that I want to make for you today. Paul, a servant of Christ, Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture regarding his son, who is the earthly life, was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. And the people of God said, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father God, as we lift up our hands and we pray and we send our faith and all that we have to you so that you may pour down your Holy Spirit, your unctioning, so that we may hear, thus saith the Lord. Amen? Amen. Out of all, the, all of the Christian holidays, Every one of them has a Christian truth attached to them. But out of all the Christian holidays, everyone wants to be a part of Christmas. Everyone wants to be a part of what there is in Christmas because there's such an amazing promise there. There's something there that people know is magnificent, that is filled with love and faith and joy and hope, and they all want to be a part of it, and they all want to know there's something about Christmas. It is interesting because I was driving by a Unitarian church, and it said a Messiah sing-along, and I thought, how interesting, because the Unitarians, as you know, I've gone to some of their services and they talk about poetry and they may sing over the rainbow and what a wonderful world this is, but they will never mention the word Jesus. And yet come Christmas, they want to have a Messiah sing-along. I have some friends, some Jewish friends, who love to put up Christmas trees and celebrate the Christmas spirit, but they certainly wouldn't mention Jesus in their home. It's interesting, when we were in Australia, I won't tell you which sister, but the sister who is least Christian of us all three has two Christmas trees in her house, lights all around her house, lights outside her house, and yet there will never be mention of Jesus in that house. And so I want to say to you this morning, how is it that we can have this big birthday party splash for Jesus and yet not invite him to the party? How can we do that? How is that? We have to recognize this morning how important it is that Jesus is at the center of Christmas. We have lost that. In fact, you'll go out and you'll see Christmas sales for sale, and they will have X trees because they won't put Christ in it. Most of you or some of you went to holiday parties. You will not go to a Christmas party because it's not politically correct to call it a Christmas party. In fact, there will be no talk of Jesus at your holiday party. Amen? If you want to clear out a subway train, you just start coughing, and you notice everybody at the next stop will get off. If you also want to clear it, start talking about Jesus. Start talking about Jesus, and you'll notice the people around you will start to move away. A, a famous pastor of ours, a friend of ours we were talking about, he was at his family, his, his uh, high school reunion, 
And when they were starting to talk about what they did, and he said he was a minister, when he went to go get a drink and came back, everybody left the table. They cleared out. And so this morning, I just want you to know that if we don't put Jesus back in Christmas, there is no meaning to Christmas. You can't separate Christ from Christmas. It is all about Christ. It is only Christ that brings us love and hope and joy and the faith that we need this morning. And so this morning, I want you to know that we are centrally focused on Jesus Christ. Because what Christmas means to me is all about the birth of Christ. And what that means for us is so important. So let us walk through that. Because we have been walking through the book of John. And we know how important it is that Jesus who claims to be God and what he said in the book of John. Remember the I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am your resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the vine. We remember that he made these statements and that afterwards people wanted to kill him because of what he said and what he was doing. But he said, I am the Messiah. And to accept him is to get all of this, the bread of life, the light of the world, the door that leads you to heaven, and the good shepherd who will take care of you and watch over you. You will have resurrection and life. You will have the way, the truth, and the life, and you'll be connected to the divine through the true vine. And that is what you get when you accept Jesus into your life. But to reject Jesus is to remove everything from your life is to lose everything from your life. Somebody ought to say amen. Because you lose everything in your life when you don't have Jesus there. And I know the Christmas story sounds like a Christmas fable, a virgin birth, a Gabriel angel coming from heaven. We hear three wise men and the shepherds, and it sounds like a Christmas story, but I have to tell you, it's a meaningful story that happened for your life and for my life, and it means all the difference in the world. It means all the difference in the world for you and for me. And remember, I'll go back to a Christmas text that says in Luke 2nd, this was a prophecy that Simeon made when, the, when Mary and Joseph brought the baby to, to the temple. And this is what he said. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, this child is destined to call the, cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against. To be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and the sword will pierce their own soul. The sword will pierce your soul and it will reveal what is in your heart. This is what was prophesied, that he would cause the rising and the falling of many, that he would be spoken about. And so Jesus, the great creator of the universe, the light and the heavens and all that there is, chose to come as an innocent, feeble baby. He could have come down with legions of angels, but that would not have helped us. Let me tell you why this is so important this morning. Because the, the omnipotent, the omnipresent, the all-living God took off his robe, put down his scepter, took off his crown, and came down and through Mary, the line of David, which what, what Paul tells us and, and Matthew tells us in 1 1 when we look at the genealogy, he comes from the line of David and the Holy Spirit. He was both God and both man. And this is the importance of what we talk about during Christmas. Psalm 8 is one of my favorite Psalms. When you consider your heavens and the work of your fingers and the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what are we? that you are mindful of us? Who are we that you would care for us? And who are we that you would visit with us? Who are we that this great God of heaven would come down and visit with us? This is what Christmas means to me, that he would take that time 
because he cared for us and he would come down and visit with us. And so this morning you must understand that he was fully God and fully human, both in one. The mystery of Christ, having two natures and understanding the anticipation and waiting for Christ. You know, when you remember, I remember when we used to um, wait for Christmas Day as kids. You know, the excitement and the wonder that Christmas was here. And our, and our parents would bribe us. They would want us to go to midnight mass. And we said if we could open one gift. And so in exchange for opening up one gift, we would go to midnight mass, and then we would go home, and we would sit up all night waiting, and we would, you know, parents wanted to sleep late that night, and we would not let them sleep late that night. It was time to get up, because we had open presents. We wanted to see what was there, the surprise, the wonder, the awe. I hope you haven't lost the awe of Christmas, because the true gift is Christ. And if you realize what the true gift is, you will know there's a wonder and awe to be received every Christmas, the birth of Christ in each and every one of us. And so as we participate in gift exchange and all kinds of things, understand you have received the greatest gift on earth. You have received the eternal. And so this morning, the gift that keeps on giving, the gift that gives you everything you could possibly need in this world, how can you reject the giver and just accept the gift? I mean, it would be like Sierra saying, thank you, Dad, but I want to have nothing to do with you. That's what we do. We are saying thankful for the gifts of life. And yet, we don't thank the giver who has given the gifts of life. And so this morning, you can't separate Christ from Christmas. They are one and the same. And Jesus, who became incarnate, he was God first and then became human fully. He could have come any way he wanted to, but he chose to come as an innocent baby in a manger among the mooing of the cows and the goats. And I don't know if you've ever been in a farm, it smells funky. He didn't want to be in the palace born. He could have been in the palace like Moses, but he chose to be born in a manger, in swaddling cloth. This is important this morning. As we recognize what does Christmas truly means, that he will reveal what is truly in our hearts, that he will pierce our souls. And this text I know that I've given you this morning is not a Christmas text. But it gives us all that we need to understand this morning that Christ is fully human and Christ is fully man. And the two natures are important because there is an ancient creed. Now, understanding Grace Congregational Church and Congregational Churches don't have creeds because we're made up of three, five, actually five lines of churches, and so we don't have a creed. We have a statement of faith, but we don't have a creed. You go to the, the Catholic Church, and they have the Apostle Creed. But I'll give you an older creed. It's the Anathanasian Creed from the third century. And it said this, Furthermore, it is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believes rightly the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man, God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the worlds, and a man of substance of his mother, born in the world, perfect God and perfect man, of a reasonable soul and human flesh. Perfect man and perfect God. That is who we celebrate this morning. That is who we look to as our Lord and Savior. This is so important that we understand he is the God, he was the substance of the Father, and he was the substance and chose to come through the vessel Mary. And we understand, even if you don't believe in a virgin birth and you think that's a crazy story, understand what it means. It is the principle that God came through spirit and human being coming together. That is who we are, spirit and human beings together. 
It is important that we see that this morning. And so I want to just take you to the understanding of why that is so important. You remember trading places with Dan Aykroyd and, and Eddie Murphy, feeling good, Billy Ray, because here was a poor person who took the place of a rich man and did the trading and stock and the fun that they had in doing all that. It's one of my fun, f- favorite movies. But trading places is what we do with God. Trading places. Sin, what for the most part we think sin is, breaking the rules of God. Can I tell you what sin is? Sin is taking the place of God. Sin is sitting on God's throne as if we're our own maker, as if we're our own creator, as if we're the only ones who brought us to this planet Earth and formed us. We act like that all the time. And did you know that God created you? God did that. Did you know that you are alive today because God did that? Did you not know that you are the one who you are because God did that? You didn't do that. You went to sleep last night. You couldn't keep your heart beating. You couldn't keep your lungs pumping. And you couldn't even wake yourself up this morning. Can I say to you, God did that? And yet we act like we walk around like we're okay and we're doing it all for ourselves and we're keeping our own breath. It is God who keeps you just where you are. And so we are sitting on his throne pretending like we did this all for ourselves. And God is saying, what should God do, actually? How should God respond to you sitting on his throne? In the old days, they would do off with your head. But God is compassionate. God is loving. And instead of punishing you for sitting on your own throne, he got off his throne and came down to earth and took your place and lived the life that you should have lived and then died the death we should have died for the crimes that we committed. That is the trading places that he did. And that's what Christmas means to me, that this great God of heaven came off his throne that we were sitting on unrightfully and came and said, I have to be with my people on earth and redeem them because they can't redeem themselves. And so that's the essence of sin. And the essence of salvation is God coming and saving us. And he trades places with us and does that by descending from heaven and coming down through the line of David. And so that is what we owe our life to God. And we know we can't pay it back. We know we can't give back to God what God has given us. So God came and did what we could not do for ourselves. And so this morning, we know that we have not been living the life that we ought to have been living. We have not been living the life as if we owe our Creator everything there is. We have not been living that life because if we were living that life, we would see the joy that we ought to have in our life. We would see the peace that we ought to have in our life. We would see the faith and the love that we would have in our life if we were doing what Christ had taught us to do. But we're not doing that. And all of us have moral standards. And let me tell you how I know your moral standards, how you judge other people. Because you give yourself excuses for not living the way you should live, but you don't give other people the same sort of grace that they ought to have when they, don't, when they break your cardinal rules. And so if I had a recorder that followed you around on this earth, and on the last day we played it, you would see and you would know, as, as Shatria told showed us, that's hell. If we were to show our life to everybody and everybody knew our inner thoughts and our inner actions. And so we're not even living up to our own standards. What if I told you God's standards are even higher than that? What if I told you God's standards are even, even higher than our own standards? And so we're not living up to our standards, but God has helped us by coming to earth and saying, I'll live the life you should have lived, and then I'll die the death you should have died. This is important this morning, as he shows us how to live, how to love our enemies. You couldn't possibly go through what Jesus go through, and at the end of the day, say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
You could not have gone through what Jesus went through on the cross when he was there on the cross, hanging on the cross, and he looks up, and the Father had to turn his back on him. And he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? It is important that we recognize who God is and he, who Jesus is, is man and also God. Let me tell you why that gives me great comfort this morning. A man dying for my sins would not make it, would not be worth it. But God dying for our sins makes all the difference in the world. Because when God dies for our sins, we know the value of human blood is priceless, but we don't even know the value of God's blood. And he's, he poured out his blood for us. And that's what we celebrate on Christmas Day that he would come and visit with us, live with us, go through the pain and the suffering and the mockery and all of that. He knows what it is to have nails in your hands. He knows what it is to have a crown of thorns. He knows what it is to carry a heavy cross down the Via Della Rosa. He knows the pain and the suffering and so I am joyful today because I know I have a God I can go to who knows what pain and suffering feels like. I got one thank you in here. Amen. One thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Amen. But can you imagine the Savior who didn't have to go through all that, went through all of that for me and for you, and that's why this morning you need to know that you have a God who knows your inner thoughts, but not only that, has gone through everything you've gone through. That's why we can go to God, and he knows how you feel. I don't care how many tears you have cried. It says that he cried tears of blood in Gethsemane. I don't care how many tears you have cried. He cried over Jerusalem for you. He felt. He wasn't the man of steel that had no feelings. He had feelings. He was tempted by the devil, right? The devil said, you're hungry. You've been fasting for 40 days. Why don't you turn those stones into bread? And what did Jesus say? Man does not live by bread alone. He didn't even use his own power to turn bread or stones into bread. So this morning, we celebrate this God who has done for us what we could not have done for ourselves. It's important to hear that his blood, his blood, it says, keep watch over yourself and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherd of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. He bought his blood. With, this, with his blood, he bought this church. I know George said the other day, if, if if we, men would love their women as Christ loved the church, of course they would be submissive. Did you not say that, Dr. George? Now, I won't, I won't editorialize on what he said, but what I will say this is, yes, what it is about is a relationship. And when you get into a relationship where you are serving one another, obedient to one another, submitting to one another. I know those words make you squirm in your seats. But when you do that for each other, there's love there. There's commitment there. There is so much more there. And what Christ did for us was submit to the Father, give up his power so that he could do for us what he needed to do. That's a relationship. And it's easy to submit to God when you see what he has done for you first. It says he loved you first before you even loved him, before you were even capable of loving him. He loved you first. And that's why this morning we understand that our God, who is the God who is perfect man and perfect human, I want to read this to you. Charles Wesley wrote this. Our God contracted to a span, 
incomprehensibly made man. He could not have been your place taker, but because he's God, he can. Because he's human, he can. He took your place only because he was God and only because he chose to come as an infant on Christmas Day so that he could be human and go through the human experience of growing in wisdom and stature. And so we thank God, amen. We thank God for what he has done. And God made him who had no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. You want to talk about joy? Here's the joy. He took our place. He took all of our sins. He took that pain and that suffering, the 39 lashes. He took the pain on the cross, all of our sins. He became sin for us who was no sin so that we could be the righteousness of God and go before heaven. Some of you are suffering with guilt. Some of you are thinking, I've done such atrocious things in my life, God could never love me. And I'm here to say this morning, God's blood is more powerful than anything you did. God's forgiveness is more powerful than anything you did. So whatever guilt you're struggling with this, this morning, I want you to leave it at the altar because God's righteousness is upon you because he took it, he took it for you and died upon the cross. And so this morning, Jesus' failure, Jesus' rejection, Jesus' suffering, Jesus' forsaken, he understands you. He understands what you're going through. He knows what you've been through. And you don't want to go to a pastor, and you don't want to go to a priest or a therapist and someone say, and what did you do? How could you do that? Really? Jesus will never do that. He will say, my child, I understand, because I've been there. I've been human. I've known what it's like. I understand you. And so his blood, I love when Carlton sings, the power of the blood will never be lost. The power of the blood, because it is the one that saves us, and so fully God and fully human. If you understand this morning, I hope you'll open your Bible at some point this week to Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. I hope you'll open your Bible this week to realize what a God we serve. A mighty child was born unto us a wonderful counselor, an everlasting father, and a prince of peace. Fully God, fully human. It's all that matters this morning. And I hope you hear this sermon because if you want joy that passes all understanding or joy that you wake up in the morning with, then you need Jesus because that'll give you the joy that you need. You want peace that passes all understanding? then have Jesus in your life. If you want faith in a faithless situation, then have Jesus. He'll show you what faith looks like when all things look lost. We thought Friday looked like everything was lost. Saturday looked like everything was lost. Sunday morning, but the Baptists say, early Sunday morning, he came back to life. He came back to life. And so if you want faith, look at God. It looked like things were over. His apostles and disciples went and hid in a room because they thought it was over. You want love? How do you love in a loveless situation? You find Christ. That's how you love. I can love people that will never love me back. I can love people that can hate my guts because I'm filled with the love of Christ. And that love allows me to go into a room where I'm hated and not cared for. And I don't need their love and I don't need their attention 
and I don't need them to like me. I'm just there to share God's love because you can operate God's love even when it feels like there's none in the room. You might be the only light someone sees this Christmas holiday. As George was saying, praying for someone as you walk by them, you may be the only one that they see light in Christ. I talked to someone yesterday and they said, you know, Christmas is a tough time for me. I lost my father at five years old on Christmas Eve. When every other kid was excited about opening up presents. And when I went to the funeral, I thought my father was asleep. I thought my father was going to come back at some point. And so every Christmas, this lady is well into her 80s. And Christmas is still a painful experience for her. I want you to understand this morning that as we celebrate Christmas and the joy of Christmas, it has nothing to do with all the tinsel and the lights and the Christmas tree and the presents and the eggnog and the bubbly and all that shopping. It has nothing to do with that. You may get lost in that, in fact. And can I just say one last thing? I know T.J. Holmes was in the news third time he had his affair with someone on, on job. See, God doesn't give us covenants and say, here are the rules, don't break them because I don't want you to have fun. God gives us the rules because he understands us as human beings. Sure, we're sexual beings, and sure, there's temptation out there, but when you understand Christmas, that God said, I want you close to me, and the reason I gave you these rules and commandments is so that you can move closer to me. If you realize that's at stake, then all the tantalizing temptation out there to do other things, covet thy neighbor's wife and covet thy neighbor's things and not honor your mother and father. It is in honoring your mother and father and doing what Christ has taught you to do that gets you closer to God. That's what we want. And I don't want to do anything that moves me further away from God. And so I hope this, this morning you know what Christmas means to you. I only had two points. Only two. Someone say amen. Because the third point is really for you to do this week. What does Jesus on Christmas Day being born mean to you? What does it mean to you? What does him coming? Because he forgives and he forgets. He creates and he cleanses. He restores and he rebuilds. He heals and he helps. He reconciles and he redeems. He comforts and he carries. He lifts and he loves. He's the God of second chance. He's the God of fat chance. He's the God of slim chance. And he's the God of no chance at all. That is the God we celebrate on Christmas Day. And I hope it means something meaningful to you. Amen. Amen. My name is Jesus, and he loves me. And I know this, because he died for me when he rescued me. There's no greater love in the world. His name is Jesus, yes, he loves me, and I know this, cause he died for me, and he rescued me, there's no great love in the world, and that love is unconditional, unconditional
Father is waiting for you to open up your hands and give him your heart. I know he loves me, Jesus, oh Jesus, uncomparable love, unconceivable love, uncompromising love. child cancer God, we come to you at this moment with gratitude in our hearts for all that you have done for us and how can we repay you when you have given us everything and sacrificed all for us and so lord god it is only with a heart of thanksgiving that we give back to you and so god bless you god bless you in your giving amen Hooray. 